This is when we are starting the class. I hate that. So start putting this up 15 minutes oh. before, okay? Don't come at one o'clock. This one is responsibility. Start putting it before. Okay, let's go. Last day, uh, I stopped at, the, at this position where I was talking on the reason for the failure of. Can you hear, guys? Okay. So the fifth reason that uh, Nate Silva uh, highlight in this book is uh, not taking the uncertainty into account. Uh, so uncertainty means that the things can change very dynamically and drastically in any kind of complex or dynamic system. Uh, so uh, he says that every forecaster should take this uh, concept of uncertainty into account when making their predictions and when making uh, their models uh, that such that high accuracy can be obtained. So this risk should be mitigated so that uh, the model works in any uh, situation uh, in respect of the uh, environment change or the uh, other scenario change or situation change. So he says that uh, when we make a prediction, uh, we should uh, make that prediction and optimize it uh, such that looking at various angles from multiple uh, directions in order to achieve a model uncertainty. And then uh, the third main point uh, that this book talks about is the very famous phrase, the correlation does not equal to causation. Uh, as I included, as I mentioned last time that a human brain is uh, very active in making relationships and seeing patterns that there are none. Uh, so human brain simplifies the in incoming information uh, so we can make the sense of the information that we hear and what we see. So human brain uh, often does this by uh, seeing slight relationships or making bias. Uh, so this bias is the one that makes us uh, think that uh, that one thing may cause another if both change in the same way at the same time. So this known as the correlation, that's the relationship or connection between two variables when uh, when one changes, the other is likely to change, but a change in one variable does not always cause the other to change. So this is relation, but it's not causation. So for example, uh, if we collect the data of the uh, monthly ice cream sales was shark attacks in US. So we would see this pattern. So does this mean that consuming ice cream causes shark attacks? Obviously no, uh, because in warmer days, we like to eat ice cream and also people go outside and uh, go to the beaches. So uh, high uh, uh, shark attacks uh, can be seen. So another example is, uh, if we collect data from uh, the number of measles cases in US and the uh, marriage rate each year, we would see this pattern. Uh, does this mean a reduced uh, measles case is causing lower marriage rate? Of course not. Um, the modern me medicine uh, ha should have caused the reduction of the measles case and also people may uh, not marry for various reasons each year. So this is another example, like uh, high school graduates with pizza consumption. We can see this kind of pattern. So obviously this is only correlation, but it's not causation. So the problem here is that uh, these problems may look silly actually, but uh, mistaking correlation to causation is actually a very big problem in forecasting. So, uh, the problem here is that the humans are easily fooled by the concept name as the randomness. And uh, there's another book called Fooled by Randomness that this book uh, mentioned that topic. Uh, this, uh, If you have interest in this kind of concept, you can just read it. And he says that uh, whenever we make a prediction, we should be sure that uh, there's a logical explanation for the mathematical relationship that we are using in the model before we 
uh, use it in our predictions. And he says that uh, do not uh, trust data unconditionally. And also uh, this uh, Nate Silver, he also points to another research uh, done by Michael Babek uh, in his research paper, uh, what you see may not be what you get. He says that uh, in the first introduction in science, we seek to balance curi curiosity with skepticism. So that also relates to this concept uh, where uh, that also uh, talks with the hyperactive pattern recognition in humans. And so uh, the fourthly, uh, this book uh, tells about how can we become better at predicting. Uh, he uh, underlines three principles. Uh, so the first one is we have to think probabilistically. Uh, so this uh, left side graph, this includes a prediction done by the S&P 500 company, but it's not probabilistic actually. So he says that uh, whenever we make a prediction, we uh, should not make point and determinist deterministic forecast. Uh, we should make our uh, forecast probabilistically. That means uh, we should uh, uh, we should produce a range of possible uh, outcomes, like the spectrum given in the right side. So uh, this is uh, uh, results. This, these are some results of his predictions on elections. So this left side in, uh, figure includes the 538, which is his company, the forecast uh, forecast done in 2010. So here actually he has shown the seats gained by Republicans. So the uh, highlighted one is the actual prediction around 63, but he, in his own company, has provided a range of uh, outcomes that can be the final result. And also in this uh, right side figure, uh, he shows the probability of Senate candidate winnings based on the size of the lead in, in the polling average. So in here, he says that a person who, uh, who is uh, led by 5% a day before has 95% uh, percent of probability of winning, and also whereas a uh, person who is led in by five percent uh, one year before has fifty nine has only fifty nine percent of winning. Uh, so that kind of uh, varied and uh, uh, multi dimensional forecast is very good, as he says. So the second principle is uh, we have to change our forecast with new evidence. That means uh, whenever we are making a prediction and we, we are continuing along the line, uh, so we should have the ability uh, to change our forecast or our the prediction whenever new information is coming. So this actually uh, goes in line uh, with the way that we should do our research. That means in the first uh, time, uh, we can assume that our hypothesis is this and uh, this is our result that should be, but actually in research process, uh, our results can be wrong. Uh, either we should not, we, we may not uh, reach the results that we encounter and also our hypothesis also can be wrong. So whenever we uh, got our results, uh, so we should think uh, mindfully and uh, change our prediction or the forecast with the new results that we are uh, obtaining. So he says that uh, today's forecast is the first forecast of the rest of your life. So that means uh, regardless of what we uh, achieve or said in the last week or last month or last year, uh, making new forecast does not, uh, that means we have to refine our uh, forecast with the new information coming towards us. And also making a new forecast does not mean that old forecast just disappear or going to anywhere. And also the third concept he's uh, saying is that look for consensus. Uh, that means uh, whenever we are making predictions, we have to 
uh, look at multiple sources of information and also get ideas from multiple people. Uh, so in this book, he uh, talks about two forecasting styles as hedgehogs and foxes, where the hedgehogs uh, want to single-handedly predict a major event, and whereas the foxes, uh, they do forecasting using the multiple aspects, and also in the foxes, they try to aggregate uh, information and ideas from many people and then uh, make a good forecast. So, uh, this table include in that uh, compares the fox's thinking still style and the hedgehog's uh, style. Uh, he says that the fox's thinks uh, multidisciplinary. That means incorporate ideas from different disciplines, uh, regardless of their origin or their domains, and they make adaptable uh, decisions. That means uh, they change their forecast whenever the new information or new approaches coming on. And then they are self-critical critical, and then they are tolerant of the complexity of the problems. And they are cautious and empirical. Uh, whereas hedgehogs, they are specialized on certain domains and they are stalwart and they, are, they make stubborn decisions and uh, they are overconfident in their decision. They don't like to uh, change their views or how they believe on certain things, and they are ideological. Uh, so he says that the foxes are better forecasters than hedgehogs. Uh, hmm? Yeah. Uh, so at the fifth. Uh, Theorem is the uh, first con concept is the brace theorem. Uh, so uh, if we think that like uh, this situation, so think that the company is releasing an update. Uh, so I uh, think that the, the update includes some faulty uh, things. That means the update is not much a super thing. Uh, so can we come to the conclusion that uh, that company will bankrupt in next three or four months. Uh, so perhaps we uh, would not come to this conclusion in the first, very first time. Time, but what if that com the same company release release another faulty products in six months or down the line? So then we then we can come to that conclusion. That means we can conclude that oh, this company is releasing faulty products time to time. So this will rank up in the near future like things. Uh, so he says that uh, when new problems constantly arise, we must update our estimates in those kind of situations. So uh, he says that uh, we have to change our hypothesis uh, from time to time from what we see and what we hear and whenever we are making a prediction. So he says that it's the very rational thing to do. Uh, so he says that uh, we have to use Bayer's theorem, or at least we have to think in a Bayesian way when new information is coming towards us. Uh, so at last, he says that uh, only we are constantly refining our estimates on uh, certain predictions or forecasts, then we can come to the signal and further away from the noise. Yeah, uh, that's all. In so I have a question for you. I, I assume you've done a very thorough job presenting his point of view. Do you agree with everything he said in the book? Uh, no, actually. I'd like to know about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, because uh, he, in this book, he's more the way he's uh, explaining on the signal and the noise is somewhat different. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, he says that a signal is a very small thing, whereas uh, we encounter many distractions. But in real life, we uh, try to make the signal more uh, complicated and the signal more the one that means we make the signal more big. Well, so it's a very non standard treatment of signal and noise relative to, oh, I don't know, seven decades or something. I don't know. 
sweats and tanner. I don't, I don't know how far back it goes, but it goes back pretty far. And I, I found that really offensive, actually. Not, yeah. it's not what you did. Yeah. I just like, you, you don't really want to step on decades and decades of scientific theory. Yeah, and so that was the problem. So, and also, uh, when I uh, just search internet, uh, there are two types of people who criticize this book. I have quite a few and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. you have the same, same kind of reaction like, oh, oh my god, god. it's terrifying. So see, if you are in AI or any kind of machine learning field, correlation, causation argument will always come, it will never leave you. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to say now, don't think I'm this part of that part. I'm just giving you the counter story as well. You should know. Okay. Okay. So when I did a lot of work on this psychosociological analysis, people always, you know, kill me with this question. Correlation is not correlation. But look at, you know, kind of work deeper does. You know the way than correlation. You don't know what is happening inside the brain. You know, there are stories, but nothing is found. Okay. So quite a few counterpoints. So let's say, uh, this is a nice story about uh, capital punishment. And who don't believe this correlation, correlation, they always count to count that example. So there was a study, you can search online, I can send you the video in the 70s and 80s. So whether capital punishment cut down the crime rate? Yes or no? Some people say yes, some people say no. Who said no? They, you know, there's an example well studied in the 70s in the US, which shows yes, it does. If you do capital punishment, crime rate goes down. It's a you know, complete positive correlation. So people say, okay, court was. It was. So uh, then there is a famous quote by a British economist. He says that if you torture your data enough, it yeah. will confess to what you do, what you want. <laughs> so how you are torturing your data is a question. So keep that in mind you now. And, uh, and another last point on the Bayesian theorem. See, Bayes' uh, problem with this generative uh, probabilistic theorem is it is highly biased towards the seen problem, pH. What it has seen, it never <laughs> can do what is not seen. Right? So your pH is multiplied with your problems, right? Which is, you know, seen problem. So it's very difficult to model using Bayesian theorem. So these are three, you know, just input from my side. Yeah, I've got I got more. Um, <laughs> okay. The fox and hedgehog distinction is not his, it's Sariki. And that would come up in the in in your stuff. Um, I, I was and, and just even the whole appeal to Bayes theorem was certainly not his. And so I just I found this to be not very scholarly and kind of annoyed that it got publicity that it got and all these awards and stuff. I think on the positive side, what I would say about this is that it made some portion of fairly well-established scientific research on these matters accessible to the public. And that is a service. Having said that, I don't like the lack, and I didn't read it, so I don't know, but I don't like the lack of scholarship in attributing his insights to the places that they came from. That re that's really offensive to me. Now, maybe it's in there. Maybe, you know, we look in the, in the back and we're gonna see Sariki and we're gonna see Kahneman and we're gonna see, I assume we're gonna see Bayes. Um, the signal to noise thing is just totally bizarre. <laughs> it's just bizarre. Well, what is noise and what is signal? Yeah, well, I mean, and, and just the whole, the, we have a framework for thinking about signal to noise. You know what it is, you've looked at it yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, just to, to have a sort of a totally different interpretation of lexical terminology that we've been using for I don't, 70 years <laughs> really is not a good thing. It doesn't help our science. The, but uh, that's the uh, how that uh, 538 company predictions are going on. Well, that's okay. that's so, fine. Let me put another example. <laughs> so I, I once upon a time I met with the CTO of Eclipse. You probably don't know in this age. There was an ID once upon a time in Java yeah, for Eclipse. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he was giving an example, very nice example. He said, we decided to revamp our ID in three months. So we call very experienced people in our you know, company. We give it to them and we ask very young guys, 
or almost no experience to them. So we give the same goal. You know, three months, we have to do it. it was, and they know it's an impossible goal. Nobody can do it. So basically, experienced people could not do it. And these unexperienced people, who are you, they did it. So what, then what is the conclusion? So they should do it. But if these guys have more energy, their work, blah, 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 then it, so uh, if you if you say you know I'm going to predict whether the company is going to bankrupt by looking at the previous data, yes, but also there are a lot of other things right, in the world. COVID now recession is there. So, we don't know. So so anyways, argument will go on, but let us stop here. So this paradigm is never ending argumentation story. Causation and correlation will never end. And the open world problem. Yeah, open. And the and the intrusion of things that we lump into uncertainty, which is just a a placeholder for influences that we really don't understand, yeah. like COVID. <laughs> Dynamic systems. Dynamical systems, yeah. There'd be, there'd, it would, yeah, yeah, these concepts can't be applied to that kind of complex. Yeah, so, so basically, to the problem where you have multiple unknown factors. Yeah, yeah. Now, how you want to model it with the dynamic system, using complex machine learning, non optics, uh, non complex problems? So yeah. people are trying to evolve. Um, there is um, some update on the adequacy of his forecasting methods. I think since the last election, I think that's where he had problems. And I'm not sure how he did on the most recent 2022 one. But he's kind of fallen out of favor. It's 538 in trouble, actually. Economic, you know, economically, it's in trouble. So I I just like to see. You know, when you guys do these, um, a, a critical eye, <laughs> you can state what they're telling you, but I also want to know that you know that something is wrong or some things are wrong. Yeah. So, are you, do you want to, did you ask on it about it or are you just going to, no. well, he's not here, so go ahead, press ahead. Um, the wisdom of the crowd work, which is what is referred to in the hedgehogs and um, foxes, um, that did come up in the work that Shreyansh Bhatt did in his dissertation. So this is probably a reasonable opportunity to just go over that dissertation quickly. 